Ink too. Spooky. Fuzzy balls. Scaly squares. Calls of plagiarism. A week ago, Alfonso Dunn released this video, accusing Jake Parker, the creator of Inktober, accusing Jake of completely ripping off Alfonso's old books and creating a new book, Inktober, every day of the year. The community is on fire. Both sides are at war. It's like a toddler slapping fight right now. Let's be clear here. I hate both of these men. I hate all of you. To have the gall to think that either of these men can make a stroke of ink and think that it's original. Enough! We all know who the real inspiration is here. It's me. I'm Art. This is my town. It went from excitement, intrigue, to being appalled. Like, whoa, 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 wait a second. I had a really horrible uh, experience, really disappointing experience yesterday, and I'm going to share with you guys. I just want to emphasize the importance of protecting your creative work. People will try to steal it and claim it as their own. This has been my first book, Pen and Drawing Simple Guy, and my second book, The Pen and Drawing Workbook, right? I actually went online and, and I was looking at the book, and then I noticed that there was a new book by Jake Parker that's uh, yet to be released. Then I clicked on this. And then I noticed this image. I was thinking to myself, nah, this looks familiar. I think I've seen this before. And of course I've seen it before because I created that image. I was out there gathering all the evidence for myself and I'm thinking, why am I doing all this work? I got all of you to do the work for me. So you started gathering evidence, bringing it to me. And it's like unlike anything I've ever seen before. You're a bunch of little detectives. I specifically told you to gather evidence from other art books because we're going to, I'm going to make a graph, I already made the graph, and we're going to be looking at all of these other art books and comparing them and seeing just how much plagiarism there is. Whenever I tell you I'm an expert on this situation, I kid you not, every single one of my ideas has been stolen. I've plagiarized, I have scammed off of you losers. Even this video itself, you ever heard of D'Angelo Wallace? D'Angelo's music. <clears throat> his video composition. That's mine now. Now this applies to the rest of the video, but why do I do this? Because it works. I suck and I know that, but I can see what's successful in a market and I know what works. I'm gonna be going over both sides and I'm even going to be uncovering every single time that I've successfully plagiarized and stolen from hardworking people, just like you. All right, and listen, I'm a professional in the animation and film industry. I already have a job, but now probably not for long. So if you're looking for any help on any projects, uh, you can hire me, I'll, I'll work for free. Alright, I'm gonna tell you the situation. You and me, we're gonna gather evidence together, look at this graph, I'll make Alfonso's case, and then I'm gonna make Jake's case. But in the end, then I'm gonna tell you what this video is actually about. And you know, I came into this situation thinking, I'm just gonna make a good drama piece, you know? I'm just gonna have fun, ruin a couple lives. It's just clean drama fun, you know? That's all I wanted to do, honestly. I did not start this video to make a positive impact on your life, or to make you think with intelligence. I did it because it's drama, it gets the views, makes me money. But even now, shooting this video, it has evolved into something so much bigger, so much more than the situation. The conclusion of all of this is, this isn't about them anymore. This has happened before. You ever heard of James Charles? This changes things for you, this changes things for me, for the art community as a whole, the internet culture as a whole. This is something that we need to look at in a bigger picture and we need to start thinking about this. And thank gosh these October themes lined up because it's about to get spooky right here you want to have a pattern and repeat it that's essentially the idea however you want to vary it a bit keep the pattern but vary it a bit alfonso that means more than you know alfonso's gone on amazon went onto the inktober every day of the year book alfonso clicks on it and he's flipping through these pages but then after flipping through the posts uh there's no more images that we can really use for reference so what does Alfonso do? Is he goes in and he finds a video of Jake flipping through this new book that hasn't been published yet. The last thing is a 30 second flip through of the book. He's just flipping through the book, flipping through it. That flip through was 30 seconds, guys. And in those 30 seconds, I already saw multiple glaring examples from my book. So what did I do? I recorded it and I'm going to go through it. Detective Dunn, I like it. I'll start off by saying that if you are searching for a pattern in anything, you will most likely find that pattern. That's called a conspiracy theory. I'll leave it at that. But now my burning question is, does Jake even know this guy? Does, this, does Jake even know Alfonso's work? 
can actually see here on this is on the Instagram Inktober profile. He posted an excerpt from my book. As you look through these photos from Alfonso's great book, Painting Drawings, you'll see that everything can be broken down to smaller shapes and structures. I even liked it myself, you know, so you can see it here. He posted uh, several pages, two, three, three pages. There you go. So there's no way you could say he's not familiar with my book. So he does know who Alfonso is. He has seen his work. He's familiar with it. He made a post here from the book. An excerpt from the Inktober book coming soon. Wow, where have I seen this? Two step, three step scale, six step scale. Oh man. Two step scale, three step scale, six step scale. Guys, it took me so long. I, I, it took me so long to decide on the number six. You know when people say like, wow, wow, that is so easy, I could have thought of it. Yeah, but you didn't, you know what I mean? Like when we look at some of the inventions of today, it's so, a lot of them are so ingenious, they're so simple. And we wonder why didn't people think about them before? Because people didn't, that's it. People just didn't. So we have to appreciate these simple ingenious inventions or creations of people. It seems simple and that's the beauty of it. But Okay, he does have a good point here. But just because he hasn't seen these uh, six-step scales doesn't mean they don't exist in the world. That's why I actually got you to help me on the evidence is because there are things that I could have never thought of that you were bringing to my attention. I thought, well, I've never seen a six-step scale, but then you started bringing in this evidence. It just goes to show that just because I didn't think that it existed didn't mean that it didn't exist. There's a case to make against this though and that we're gonna get into that later. All right, I'm just trying to get you familiar with the situation. You don't know the thousands and hundreds of trials and errors before they, act they actually got to that. So yes, it does look simple, but the process to get to it was not. His point isn't as much of how much effort it took from him and you should feel for that. His point is, is that there's a funneling system of complex ideas that result in a very simple solution. I know what he's talking about and we're gonna be covering this later. Okay, so what goes into writing a book? This is uh, a bin I have that has all the um, materials from my first book. So this is evidence of this being his original work. You need to know how Jake responded to all of this. Okay, Jake went on the Instagram and said this. I want you to hear this directly from me. I have not plagiarized anyone's work. Of course, the books will both discuss similar topics, techniques, tools, steps of learning, etc. that have been common to the craft for decades. Unfortunately, there's an artist that has made this a public issue rather than contacting me directly. And now here's a key part of this whole situation is the community's reaction to this immediate hate. This is starting to remind me of situations that have happened on YouTube in the past. Like I said before, this whole situation isn't about them anymore, not about their situation. This is something that we need to look at as a whole, this whole situation and how we deal with these situations. I'm not going to be telling you how to act. For one, I don't care about you. I'm just going to be showing you the evidence of what's happening. All right, as long as you get granny to watch this video and make me some extra money, then me and you are good. First up, we got a major voice on the uh, art community, Peter Hahn. Uh, Peter Hahn, the main mon, P doing a Peter Hahn style. You already know who it is. I personally feel that, you know, in, in my, if I was in Alfonso's shoes, I would have probably contacted Jake directly at first, just to get that dialogue going. And if there was a sour kind of response, then would have gone to the video. You know, that's what I would have done. That's me personally. But I'm not saying what Alfonso did was wrong either, okay? All right, first off, Peter Hahn, you don't have a character. You're not being loud and annoying. Where's the entertainment? You need to be doing something. Get a knife. Something. Necklace is nice. I like that. The hat, black hat, could be a little bit more original. T-shirt, seen it. But I do believe it also creates a lot of this side taking. I'm reading all these comments and people are like, oh, I side with this. Oh, I side with that. And there's this like headbutting going on with people and they're arguing even on my post right now. And they're so opinionated because yes, they have very strong opinions and thoughts. Here's the bottom line. We gotta look around a little bit, research. People are only looking at these two books. Uh, Alfonso's book of how to draw ink and drawing. Uh, and then we also have Jake's new book that's coming out, which we don't have yet. Uh, but what it says here is this rendering in pen and ink. Oh look, here's um, you know some of the materials. Uh, this book in particular was first published in 1976. We could say that, well, this guy is using pencil. Well, here we have things like line directions. What direction to take the hatching into? Oh, here's a value system in threes for boxes, dark, medium, and light. These are all tried and true methods that we can find repeated through all of these kind of books. 
then we can say, well, he worded it a little bit differently. He has slight adjustments. Well, okay, but is that enough to make it his own thing? Just how similar are these similarities? All right, and a quick update on the situation while I was recording, somebody put out a video on the situation. And the second I clicked on this video, I hated this person. Like I said in my Instagram post, if you make a video about this situation, you've plagiarized me. This was my idea first. Legal action might have to be taken. I've heard a lot about a recent controversy that I actually found kind of interesting because I work in publication design and I love to draw and I collect art books. Alfonso's book has a very strong portrait orientation. It's a portrait format. While Jake's book is a landscape format. It's almost square even. When we analyze the pages closely, you can see a lot of differences in between layouts. And I, I wasn't gonna mention this video at all because I really hate this person. Again, with the uh, wearing a cap, wearing a shirt. You have to step up your game, is what I'm saying. This person works in publication, so the more I watched the video, I realized there was a lot of good points in there, and I'm not gonna go over it. You need to go in there and watch the video for yourself. We may cover some of the same territory, but I can guarantee you, he's not gonna be nearly as funny as me. <laughs> All right, but these two reactions are very different from the majority of the other people. These were very neutral, but for the most part, other reactions are extremely one-sided. It's absolutely bananas. Let's see this post from uh, Cloud Nuki. Please go and support Alfonso, and remember to always go and support smaller unseen artists. Really quickly, I want to point out that I thought Alfonso was a smaller unseen artist too. But if you go watch Moloch's uh, video, Moloch compares their numbers, and Alfonso's actually got a larger following. It's uh, very interesting. At the time of posting the video, Alfonso had 638,000 YouTube subscribers. Jake had 168,000. Alfonso had 169,000 Instagram followers, and Jake had 577,000. It's basically the same. In fact, if you were to combine those followers between the two platforms, Alfonso actually has a larger following than Jake does. What's also interesting is I didn't actually look up those numbers myself. I just took Moloch's word for it and didn't do the research. So that really is saying something. Don't support Jake Park Parker and the Inktober prompt. Other notable things Jake Parker has done in regards to Inktober, tried to copyright Inktober despite being a community event and term sharing amongst the uh, art community, spoke out against digital artists who wanted to do Inktober digitally. I will not be participating in Inktober this year. All right, let's pause here for a second. I'm actually editing the video right now and I have to talk about this right now. So at the end of the video, I give my own take on the solutions to this problem and I go into the importance of the situation. But while editing this, I decided that I needed you to hear this right now. And it has to do with this Instagram post. I feel like everything can be summed up in this hilarious post. Uh, it's like a microcosm of this entire situation. All it is is just these two comments saying that Jake tried to copyright Inktober despite being a community term event, and Jake spoke out against digital artists who wanted to do Inktober digitally. Okay, so these accusations themselves, they're not really that important. I don't care about the accusations. All right, but I just noticed that if I go over here and scroll down all the way down in this description, all the way down past all these new flippin' hashtags, at the very bottom of this thing where nobody's gonna see it, is there these two flippin' edits to this thing? And I'm just not realizing there's no edit one, so I don't know where that went. Edit two says, I've been made aware that Jake is no longer against the idea of digital art being used for Inktober, as clarified in an email statement sent to his subscribers. Again, I don't care about the accusations. It's just the fact that it's so flippin' easy to point fingers and do an Instagram post and this sucker got like 100k likes. Meaning that you can hide the edit, you can hide your mistakes at the end of a post where nobody's gonna see them, but you have these accusations at the very front of essentially what's like a news article. All right, so the point of all this is, it's not in the details, the words you use or the points that you're trying to make. I don't care about that. It's specifically about the fact that people vomit information on the internet that they don't have, uh, they haven't properly researched before. The point is, even if the information is wrong that you're putting out there, it can still hurt people's reputation. And I talk about this at the end of the video, but it's easy, it's so easy to shout and yell and like point fingers and crap on the internet. It's grueling and boring and not fun to do your research. Okay, this spreads like wildfire and it's dangerous. Shame on you, Jake Parker, for taking advantage of another artist. But this isn't the first time you turned against your fans and supporters in the name of greed. You broke my spirits in the love for Inktober. It's a tragedy and a horrible thing that you did. I will no longer trust in your work or your projects. Goodbye. Unfollowing you and will never participate in Inktober. Shame on you. Unfollowed with the middle finger. I like that one. Here's a very important one that I see repeated. 
Alfonso Dunn's video is all I needed to see. Keep that one in your brain for later. All right, and then Tom Bancroft came in, and a lot of people that are getting involved with this are big names, like Tom Bancroft. He's like a super big Disney dude. I agree with Alfonso, and he had the right to be surprised and suspicious, and yes, there are many coincidences between the layouts and wording, but what you're not doing, and neither is Alfonso, is looking at all the other books that influence both artists to see if there's similar wording or layout. Because there are. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks for that idea. Thank you. And here I'm about to address the whole question of this whole thing. The subject and the fundamentals that we're talking about here, without a doubt, is the same throughout history. We're not questioning that. All of these books are going to look similar in some way, some form or fashion. Inking strategy, shading, technique, tools used, page layout, words used, yada yada. It's the same, always has been, always will be. Here's the question we need to be asking. Where are the fuzzy balls at? Am I right? <laughs> Here's the question. How many times do these coincidences align? And also, how many patterns of coincidental alignment does it take to become plagiarism? So he posted some information about the book. He made a post about the book all year long, published by Chronicle Books. Strokes, effective pen control, control, basic types of strokes. He calls it basic strokes. Ways to vary a stroke, the variations of a stroke. He has variation. I notice he doesn't use the word strokes, I guess that would be a dead giveaway, so he uses lines instead. What I'm going to do is every single time Alfonso makes up a case in the video, I'm going to take Jake's book, Alfonso's book, and all of the other books and compare how similar they are to each other. He's got some points, okay? But as we move further down the line, the am evidence gets damninger and damninger. Here are the other books we're comparing to. Rendering in Pen and Ink by Arthur L. Guptil, drawing with pen and ink, also by Arthur L. Guptil. All right, and we find out later that this guy uh, plagiarized himself. It was pretty interesting. How to draw in pen and ink by Susan E. Meyer and Martin Avilas. Creative illustration by Andrew Loomis. Beginning pen and ink, Desiree Lee. And then boom, we got the detective section where all of you kids went through and uh, gathered evidence. And some of these books were recommended by you, so good job. All right, we're going to be looking at all right the words used, the illustrations, and does it all fall under the same page? All right, I can only find one example for this book, and I'll say this, these books are long. These PDFs are extremely long, and I went through every single one of them. All right, this one has four stages, nothing really to compare it to. Let's move on. Drawing with pen and ink. In this one, I searched the keyword strokes because I couldn't really find anything else. Didn't have anything on that one, nothing, nothing. Uh, the next chapter is the stages of a draw. Oh, wow, right here, see? Man, he couldn't have even come up with a different title. There you go, stages of a drawing. Stages of a drawing. Stages of a finished drawing. And this one, straight up, stages of a drawing. All right, and this is what happens to me throughout the whole process. It's like, I swear I've heard this before, but the more I'm looking into these books, I can't find it. This book's nothing, nothing. Variation in lines. Wow, variations of a stroke. Ways to vary a stroke. Guys, this is another thing. It took me so long to decide on what word to use. This one I kind of found interesting. Variations in lines, ways to vary a stroke. All right, kind of blurry, but he says size, spacing, layers, direction, weight. All right, and if you read through these, they're pretty similar. And when you compare them to these, all right, we learn that this is nothing new. These squares, we've seen them everywhere. The way Jake is doing these is pretty different in layout for the most part. Rendering in pen and ink. One thing I'll say about Arthur Guptil is that this fella, nobody has presentation like him. This smooth presentation. In fact, it's so smooth and it's so nice that uh, he rips himself off and he does it again in his second book. All right, but between these, we can see the lesson is the same, obviously. It's just a different layout, different wording. Pen and ink, nothing. Andrew Loomis, nothing. Here's a title, Thick versus Thin Lines, but this is the only example. So for this one, he's got a point that these titles are kind of matching up, but nothing else is really matching up. So, all right, so he's kind of, uh, he's kind losing me here so i discussed the basic strokes after that he discussed the basic strokes there are certain types of uh strokes in pen and ink drawing that are standard but to just copy the format come on nothing really big there but these patterns of these uh titles is getting to me all right and for arthur you're always going to see this nice presentation but we're all going to agree that we've seen squares like this before in art school or whatever all right nobody's questioning that like I said, I'm searching key words and trying to find if they're the same examples. And from pen and ink, we have line stroke examples. But from this composition, you can see that they're all on different pages. Again, for all of this, I'm not looking for connections, and neither should you. You should be taking in all of this information and just seeing, just seeing how other people have done their books and how many other possible ways there is to do an art book. Right after that, I have 
texture follows form. Take a closer look at it, and I'm like, wow, that looks really familiar. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been asking for the fuzzy balls, and we found them. This is where things start to get heated. Those titles almost match, but I can tell you what does match. And this is fuzzy balls. It feels like I've got a caulk board and I'm just sticking fuzzy balls on it and I'm connecting the red string. There's no denying that I, uh, these are very similar, but I swear I've seen fuzzy balls on the internet. I swear I've seen these, these little dip and dot textures on art things on the internet. This is a thing that we're not considering is the internet is a book. The internet is a whole new piece of information gathering system. So looking at all these old books, that's this hearsay. Really, we need to be looking at current things that could have uh, influenced both of these fellas and led them to the same conclusion. Arthur gives examples. No fuzzy balls. No dipping dots. Just a bunch of bricks. Drawing with pen and ink? Nothing. 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 Pen and ink? That's all this had? All right. Nothing. Kind of fuzzy, but it ain't no ball. Control. All right. So I'm discussing the importance of holding your pen a certain way, holding it vertically. Here he has the same thing, holding it away from the point, holding it close to the point. Of course, he has the same illustrations over here. Specific, accurate line work. I definitely can't deny that these look similar, but I swear I've seen these in art books before, right? Holding the pen. This book doesn't have any illustrations about it. Here's something interesting, holding the pen. We have a little illustration of a little pen. All right, that's close, that's close. Nothing, nothing, nothing else. But again, how many times are you scrolling on Instagram and you go through one of these losers that make a little uh, how to draw tutorial and they have a little picture of a hand drawing something. I swear I've seen that post. That's the thing. I don't have all the time in the world to do all of this research. If you have more information, if you know links to all of these other posts like on Instagram or Facebooks or whatever, uh, put it in the comment section and uh, people can check it out there. After that, I have additional supplies. Wow. Additional supplies. A dust brush, eraser, pencil, and a ruler. Dust brush, eraser, pencil, and rulers. <sighs> Here's where it gets pretty crazy. Additional supplies, brush, pencil, eraser, rulers. And then over here, Alfonso has a very, very similar setup. This one says materials and tools, and we got all the materials and tools, yada, yada. This one for Susan E. Meyer, this goes to show that how you can actually vary up these books. You don't have to lay out the materials in this fashion. All right, that's something interesting to consider at least, that you don't have to have a page layout like they did. Andrew Loomis, nothing. Pen and ink, additional supplies, basically on the same page. Here's the main question. Where's the brush? Spooky, that's all I'm gonna say. For me, this page, there's some pretty darning evidence here because you have page layout, you have the title, and you have the illustrations, and these patterns are lining up for me. I go to unconventional instruments, right? Oh, wow. Unconventional tools. So I have sponge. He has sponge. I have uh, fingertips. You can use your fingers. Wow. And it gets even darker, kids. Darker and darker. Unconventional tools. Toothbrush. Sponge. Stick. Fingers. Now, at this point, for me, it's not a question of plagiarism. It's who the heck is using all these flipping things? A bunch of cave people out here. That's not making any sense. All right, I'm going to say right off, this is some darning evidence because the word unconventional tools, both on these, uh, the sticks and the whatever, the word unconventional is not even in this flipping book. And it's so, so long. And there weren't any tools. I couldn't find any tools. And for this one, this is mentioning a toothbrush. Okay. For this one, we're talking about tape, erasers, uh, X-Acto knife. Andrew Loomis doesn't care about it. All right, and this one we're talking about a feather. This is still with the caveman thing. I don't know what's going on. All right, we're done with this page and we're getting close to the end. This page for me, it really aligned. Um, got kind of spooky, kind of scary. If you know of any other popular Instagram posts that have a bunch of sticks and a bunch of sponges and rocks that people are painting with or whatnot, put that in the comments section below and we can check out the evidence there. Here I discussed materials. And you can see there's the quill pen and you can see the dip pen. Here you can see is using the same layout design. I re you know what? It really gave me an appreciation for publishing companies. I learned about the different skill sets, the different professionals that come together to actually publish a book. The author is just a beginning, right? You prepare the content, you get but the publishers, you have the designer, you have the play page layout designer, you have the graphic designer. Sometimes they have their own illustrator. You have uh editors different at least four or five sometimes at least three different editors 
So the point I'm making is, even deciding on layout, spacing, sizing, all this stuff takes a lot of work. Okay, but I feel like I've seen this before, right? Just people putting pins on their whatever. So let's look. Here's this layout. Got a bunch of crows in here. Don't know where that came from. All right, fountain pens, yada yada. Andrew Loomis still doesn't care. Okay, and here's the closest thing that I can find, but they're all on separate pages. They're not lined up next to each other, so. But again, I swear I've seen this somewhere, right? Like, this is how I'm thinking for all this. Okay, so here is the next page. This, he, this guy, how lazy are, look at my illustrations and look at this. Look at this and look at this. Look at this and look at this. Here, I showed a complex block form. So I'm showing that you can apply the same, the same three-step value uh, method to applying a complex form. And he did the same thing here. And this is supposed to be a body of work that you're presenting, you're selling to the public. You're selling this to the public. Very, very darning evidence. Right here, Jake draws the Council of Squares. Demonic cult of squares. Super spooky. And you've got this disgusting, weird creature that they gathered together to form square cult stuff. Over here, Alfonso with some pretty darning evidence of the square cult's origin. And with this creepy ass mother square goblin thing. All right, even with this one, it's very similar. Okay, it's just so weird to me that both of these are on the same page next to each other. Okay, and if that's a coincidence, that's that's a pretty big coincidence. But if that's a coincidence and those other two pages or three pages are coincidences, this is a lot of coincidentai stacked on top of each other. And it's, it's freaky. I don't like it. Thank God in this next section, we don't have any squares, nothing getting too culty. All right, and here's Andrew Loomis, finally, uh, given a darn about the situation. Kind of a creepy square in the back of the shadows here, but, all right, and pen and ink has lost interest at this point. It's undeniable. This is one of the most darning evidences I've seen so far. But later, when we consult with our detectives, they're gonna give us a little bit more information, and, uh, you'll see a similar example. And I'm looking right here, follow form. And you can see right after that, I have texture follows form. Take a closer look at it, and I'm like, wow, that looks really familiar. Here I have some examples of how to vary the scale texture, the bumpy texture, and the fur texture. You can even see the forms here, I'm seeing the same thing. Textures follows light and shadow. That's what Alfonso says, dimensional texture and light. That's what Jake says. These examples are spookily similar. If you have children in the room, get them out. If you, if you have children in general, get, get, get away. I swear I've seen this before though. I swear I've seen this before in other art tutorials. Granted, he didn't do a hairy cube, but these squares in this bubbly looking thing, there's no denying that those are very similar. Now, how specific are scales to, um, to art books? No scales. We have a bunch of different patterns like shells and yada yada. It's just interesting to me that they're both kind of connecting on texture. It's not a new idea necessarily, but they're both using the same examples. All right, for that page, a couple of things lined up, but for this next page, he made a post here from the book, an excerpt from the Inktober book coming soon. Wow, where have I seen this? Two step, three step scale, six step scale. Oh man. Two step scale, three step scale, six step scale. Guys, it took me so long. I, I, it took me so long to decide on the number six. You know when people say like, wow, wow, that is so easy, I could have thought of it. Yeah, but you didn't, you know what I mean? Like when we look at some of the inventions of today, it's so, a lot of them are so ingenious, they're so simple. And we wonder why didn't people think about them before? Because people didn't, that's it. People just didn't. So we have to appreciate these simple ingenious inventions or creations of people, it seems simple and that's the beauty of it. But light and shadow, Alfonso's point here is that he came to the conclusion of a six scaled value scale. And his point is, is that a lot of people didn't come to that conclusion, that he came to that conclusion after going through so many different options. And here's Jake coming in, just swiping it away. All right, using this two, three, six, uh, scale thing. Artist friends and I both agree that we've seen this before. This is all over the place in other art books, two, three, six. And you know, that's what I thought going into this too, is I was looking for the six, like this is the number, even side six. But let's see what I found. 
Arthur starts off with a five. Again, in his other book, Arthur comes up with five. Very similar layout. Susan came up with a five. All right, looks pretty different too. And Andrew Loomis, like I swear I've seen Andrew Loomis do a one through six, or at least a one through five uh, value scale. But I, for some reason, I couldn't find it. I was typing it in. Maybe I was just stupid, which is very unlikely. But I couldn't find the five value scale from Andrew Loomis. Please put it in the comment section if you find it. Wow, look what he copied right after that. Controlling the range of your values because I discussed it right here. Controlling the range of your values. Light to light, middle to light, middle to deep, dark to, you know, shamelessly, just like how, I'm really appalled. I've never spoken to him. I've never had a conversation with him, never had any exchange, but I would really like to ask him, like, why did you feel the need to recreate my book? You never consulted with me at any point. We never had any conversation. How, where in your mind would you feel that no one would notice this? You could get away with this. All right, now for the last page. Well, he's got similar boxes, but also up in the corner, you see two flipping uh, bowling balls. What, whatever, whatever they're called. And again, I'm thinking, I'm thinking I'm seeing this before. I've seen these bowling balls before. Between these two pages, it says controlling the range of your gradients. And if you look on Alfonso's page, it says control the range of gradation. Th to me, this is like the third time that these things have lined up. You have page composition-ish, and you have wording, which is the titles, and you got the drawing examples. Very, very similar. They're all happening on the in the same area of the book. Okay, if it happened once, okay. If it happened twice, okay, but it, as it as we move more and more down the line, it's like it feels like it's happening too often. All right, I'm gonna go into all of the detective work that all y'all did, and I gotta say, y'all did some uh, pretty good work here. Detective Bubble was the first person to come to me with the controversy news, so that was pretty cool. Detective Bubble had some pretty good uh, examples from other art books, and look at that, furry balls. This goes to show that before jumping to any conclusions and thinking that something's completely original, that you made something original, it probably means that you just haven't seen it yet. It's out there, you just haven't even seen it, you know. Catherine Didgeridoo told me about some Peter Hahn style. Detective Micro uh, came to me with a rendering in pen and ink. Detective Dead Birds <laughs> showed me Cloud Nuki Post. Detective uh, Moron came to me with the Peter, Peter Hahn style. <coughs> Detective Joshua actually sent a lot of books, a lot of good information. You don't even want to know what Detective Cyrene said. Detective Aldori sent the uh, Loomis books. All right, and at the very bottom, we got some pretty darning evidence of uh, some creepy uh, oval cult situation. All right, what's my overall conclusion about this graph? Overall, the patterns are overlapping more than on three pages. So, which to me, that kind of goes beyond coincidence. But in creating this video, I realized that the book's not even the question anymore. It's not, it's not even what it's about. To me, it's about how the art community handled the situation. But one of the major questions being asked is, why did Alfonso go public? Many agree that Alfonso did this situation dirty. One of these comments from somebody on the internet says, Jake, you took his life's work. Had he kept quiet to reach out to you privately, your instinct would be to deny, deny, deny until the book hit presses and for you to cash out. Now see, that's the mindset that I would have. Jake might be a trustworthy person. You don't know if you can go to Jake. The ideal situation would be he would go to Jake and say, hey, you ripped me off. And Jake would say, let's handle this together and let's get you the money that you deserve or or let's get to the bottom of this situation and find out the truth. But when you're a businessman, when you know these things and how these things work legally, it's that's not how the world works. You can't just think that somebody's going to do what's gonna benefit you. Hi, I'm an IP attorney. I wouldn't necessarily jump to conclusions about the culpability, however, what I've seen happen in similar situations, and what I think might have happened here is that Parker hired a team to help him create, gather images, assembling, editing, and marketing the book. This is a big deal. The team likely purchased a variety of books from Amazon to see how best to create Parker's book. This information needs to get out. This speaks on not just this situation, but just people in general. So at this point, let's just assume that Jake isn't in it on a, alone. He has a whole team behind him that he may, ha may or may not have to get approval from to do certain things and vice versa. Right? The key being here is that we don't know any of this information. So let's say I'm Dunn's company and I look at the, the thing that's the biggest uh, art book right now on Amazon and I see Alfonso's book. They had to have seen it. So assuming that they did see it, the first option would be to see the book, take the ideas, but then change them in a very unique way. The second option would be to see the ideas and steer in the complete opposite direction and run, run away. If they did see this book, then they would have to have known that these things were very similar. Now, I can say 
what this video is actually about. Caleb says, bold statement. You have a lot to prove and I'll listen, but from YouTube, Alfonso Dunn, I don't see what you could do to prove anything but plagiarism. That is terrifying, and let me tell you why. Herein lies the problem, creative Caleb. So many kids and adults think the same way in the same uh, in, in any situation. Just because you can't see the answers to a problem does not mean the answers don't exist. You ever heard of magic, Caleb? Huh? You ever seen a knife before, Caleb? The only thing that you prove with this mindset is that you're too lazy to consider all of the other angles to any situation. Say it with me now. I'm an individual. I'm an individual. I can think for myself. The James Charles situation is a prime example of this. Somebody went on the internet, made a video about James Charles with accusations. Everybody turned on James and it was just people were unsubbing from him and it was a disaster. It was mayhem. Everybody hated him. Then he comes out with the video of proof, evidence, receipts, and the whole situation flipped and now everybody looks stupid. So now try to imagine, try to imagine if you were in James Charles situations, but you didn't have receipts, now you have no way of defending yourself. If, he, if that had happened to him to this day, massive people, a massive people would hate him and no one would really know the truth of the situation. People were so, so, so sure that James Charles was a, a bad person. And now look at the situation. All I'm saying is don't be stupid. We can see just how fast a crowd can end you guilty or not. Now Dunn coming out and making these accusations public, maybe if he would have never brought it public, no one would ever know. Maybe there would have been some kind of like legal actions and some like, I, I don't, I don't know. But the point is, is that if I were in his situation, I m may have done the same thing. Because here's the sad truth about it, and a lot of people don't know this, but if you leave a system to decide your fate and to do and to create justice, that system does not always work. You say, oh, legal things will take care of it, and yada yada, and let's just put it in the hands of the companies. I can tell you that does not work all the time. I don't know what the right answer is. I don't like anybody in this situation, but I can tell you this, me watching this situation as somebody who's at the top of the artist community. I mean, I'm the top. I'm, I am the top of the artist community. Me looking at this situation and seeing how quickly a mass of people, somebody can point at an individual and give some form of evidence and just to see how quickly a mass can destroy this person's name. That is horror film scary. That is some spooktober, spooktober stuff. And that's why I want all of you to know from the bottom of my heart, I'm a piece of crap. To bring it all back around, he may be guilty. That's not the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah, he may be guilty and we need to fight against plagiarism. Duh. The point is, do you not realize what this community just did? Regardless of being guilty or not, do you not see just how terrifying what we just did is? as a community. At the snap of a finger, it's not Alfonso's fault. I'm just looking at the outcome. This is what happened. We, as a community, as a mass, can destroy someone's name, someone's life, like, and that's the point of this video. Anyway, to wrap it all up, I need you to think that you could be in Alfonso's shoes someday, but just as well, you could be in Jake's shoes someday. You need to start thinking about the bigger picture. We're getting smarter, but we're not quite there yet. We as a mass, we need to be, we need to be smarter than this, y'all. I can't stress this enough. Mindless, radical support of either group situation leads to some serious, some serious World War II situations. All right, now I always try to come at these things with a solution, and, and it sounds nice, but let's see if it works. My solution is cancel the product Cancel the individual. It's difficult because his name is so connected to Inktober, but cancel the product, cancel the individual. This way plagiarism is hit financially, but we're not completely destroying somebody, you know? We, we have to think about these things. Because if you are part of a crowd and you collectively destroy somebody's name, you just screwed yourself over for whenever you make a stupid mistake or if somebody accuses you of doing something publicly. And you know that I lie all the time. I lie about so much stuff. You know that I could pick any single one of you and point you out and make up something crazy and come up with evidence on you and get your name destroyed because I have such control and such power over this industry. I'm not saying Alfonso did this, but I'm saying it's very easy for other people 
to edit information. I'm just saying it's scary. The, the, the situation is scary and it speaks to a larger problem here.